Greetings geologists and welcome back. We're going to be discussing the Mississippian period today. So in the United States, we separate out Mississippian and Pennsylvanian instead of calling it what the rest of the world does, which is referred to as the Carboniferous. So when you're doing research or studying online or in your book and the word Carboniferous is used, it represents the full scope of time beget from the beginning of the Mississippian period to the conclusion of the Pennsylvanian. Now the Mississippian aged rocks are very special. They have a completely different depositional environment from what we see in the Pennsylvanian. So much so that people across the globe come to America and the Bahamas to study Mississippian aged rocks because their carbonate counterparts here are not bound around the world in extensive amounts. In so much of the carbonate rocks, they're just littered, and that's an understatement, just littered and cluttered full of crinoid fragments, which is one of the reasons that this is deemed the age of the crinoids. The Mississippian period extends from 359 million years ago to 318 million years ago. We have extensive carbonate rocks, especially up from the Mississippi uh, Basin area and throughout sections of even West United States. And believe it or not, Arizona has the same types of rocks captured in the Grand Canyon, which we'll be looking at. If you take a look at these crinoid stems, look at how littered that rock is full of them. In many cases, Mississippian carbonates are so full of crinoid fragments that it looks clastic. It looks more like a sandstone. So that's why the age of the crinoids is very suiting and fitting for this geologic period. So let's just briefly discuss the difference between Carboniferous and what we recognize on the American geologic time scale. I can guarantee you this will be a set of questions on quizzes and tests because if you were to count the number of periods that the rest of the world recognizes for the Paleozoic, you would come up with six. We recognize seven because we subdivide the Carboniferous into two distinctive periods based on two distinctive depositional environments. So, Abundant coal reserves in Europe and in England specifically are what the Carboniferous is referred to. So this is an important element. We're not without Carboniferous aged rocks in the United States. Specifically, Pennsylvanian period contains the same coal bearing units that we see elsewhere around the globe for the duration of the Carboniferous. So when you're referring to the Carboniferous, you're really talking about the full duration of Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. However, our time frame in the United States really only deals with the coal producing in the Pennsylvanian, which would be the 318 million year to 299 million year time frame. For the Mississippian, we had something completely different from swamplands. We had Bahama-like conditions. We had shallow apiric seas from the Kaskaskia, and that ranged from 359 million to 318 million. So oftentimes you'll read in literature about the lower Carboniferous and the upper Carboniferous. Let me clarify. The lower refers to the Mississippian and the upper is the younger of the two, which is the Pennsylvanian. So what caused this unique situation to occur during the Carboniferous? Well, we had advancing and retreating of glaciers during the Carboniferous that attributed to Gondwana land moving over the South Pole. As this transition occurred, extensive continental glaciation occurred, which led to cycles of rise and fall of sea level. In many areas, this was a very slight rise and fall, but enough to make an important set of rock formations that are full of coal throughout the Carboniferous. But bear in mind that those coal units in the United States are restricted to the Pennsylvanian. These glacial cycles directly correspond to something that geologists refer to as cyclothems. We'll be looking at cyclothems in detail during the Pennsylvanian. In essence, they're coal-bearing units. 
In North America, we do not find cyclothems in Mississippian aged rocks, but we do in Pennsylvania. So that's one of the reasons that we subdivide the Carboniferous into two sections. So let's get busy talking about the Mississippian paleogeographic situation. This is the Kaskaskia Sea, so let's have a quick review of what went on with mountain building during the Devonian. You had the Acadian highlands get uplifted, and of course we sutured on the antler island art to create new landmass on the west coast. And we still don't have the west coast come fully, fully intact. What would happen is the Kaskaskia would invade the continent and we would fill up until this area right in here, this section right here begins dry land right here. So this will be non-marine deposition. Let me take a moment to say this will be really important in the Pennsylvanian where this marker is because sea level will rise and fall. So it's important to also note that where you see this color right in here where I'm moving the mouse around and I'll put a marker on here for you to see it. This represents area where you would see a Pyrrhic Sea, subsequently limestone. So let me point out that the Mississippi River Valley is in here. Let's go over this side of the world where uh, the United States had Arizona. That's why the Grand Canyon contains a very important rock layer for the Mississippian. Again, these rock layers that are marine limestones and dolostones are just completely full of crinoid back, uh, fragments. So, what else are they full of? Oolitic limestones and dolostones, other indications that we had a shallow apiric sea in the neighborhood. This is an important picture to digest for a minute. Let me set the stage for you. This is Ordovician aged rock right here. Do you see the Silurian limestones right here? As for Silurian, very fine grained, far away from any terrigenous input. So they're going to grade into this sea, which is not Cambrian and not Carboniferous. This is actually Chattanooga shale. So here's that thin band of Chattanooga shale. If you recall from the Devonian, that is a uranium enriched layer. And then take a look at these limestones where I have the arrow pointing to. Now compare the texture of this limestone to down here in the Silurian. And what do you notice? It looks bumpy, it looks rough, it looks clastic. That is strictly because of the enrichment of crinoid fragments that this particular set of carbonate rocks has from this time frame. Again, contributing to the age of the crinoids. Mississippian sediments are so heavily littered by crinoid stems that we have almost like a sand material made out of them, the fragments. So this is the individual pieces of crinoidal stems right here under a high magnification microscope. And then to the right is what it looks like as sand grains where those fragments are broken up and well washed into similar size, indicating more uh, marine deposition as these crinoids would die. What would that look like? We have an exact counterpart today creating the same scenario. What's really fascinating is not only is this creating the same dynamics in the Bahama Banks today, it also happens to be sitting on a Mississippian aged bank, subsequently the name Bahama Banks. So what are some evidences that we had shallow marine environments during the Mississippian? Can you see these carbonate, sandy types of materials there. Well, they're actually limestone type material, but made out of the same kind of stuff I just showed you under magnification of crinoidal stems. This is carbonate based limestoney sand, very shallow marine water, doesn't have a very big detrital influence from the Bahamas. But what's important to note is, do you see how the ripple marks are in the sand and that you can see movement like cross bedding, small scale cross bedding? So this is important because the Mississippian demonstrated the exact same phenomena. So let's take a look at this and also describe what you would have been seeing. I found it interesting in the diving that I've done in the Bahamas that the coral reefs were not large. 
And interestingly enough, in the Mississippian, they weren't either. They were small organic reefs. So you would have expected to see smaller patch reefs and smaller uh, fringing reefs and not the large pinnacle or barrier reefs that we saw in the Silurian and the Devonian. This is the type of sediments that would make up the material that the Mississippian uh, Bahama Banks are composed of. When you look at the Bahama Banks, a couple of things I want to point out here. Let's see the map first and look for the different shades of blue here. The dark blue way out here or the electric blue color is deep water. This is all really shallow and notice the horseshoe appearance. Now come here and look at the shape of this island, match it to here. Do you see the really shallow marine material here? The Great Mississippian Lime Bank is observable in the Bahamas. I took a course back in grad school where I actually traveled and we extensively looked at stromatolites and then the Bahama banks in order to learn more about this Mississippian phenomena. What I can tell you is the Bahamas is a large cluster of islands. The ones that we studied on was no longer than a mile and half a mile in width. So it was a very small research marine laboratory, but nevertheless an important one. Having been there, I can tell you the water is very shallow around most of this area. Why is that? The Mississippian limestone has built an actual platform that has raised the entire area, making it more shallow than the remainder of the Caribbean, which gives the Bahamas its very attractive shallow marine uh, habitat and appearance as to why people like to go see it in the first place. A famous geologic formation from the Mississippian is the Red Wall Limestone, one of my personal favorites in the Grand Canyon. This limestone was deposited during the Mississippian and represents exactly the depositional environment I showed you from the Bahamas. What makes it special in the Grand Canyon, besides being a fossiliferous Mississippian limestone full of crinoids, is how thick the unit is, which is very indicative of the same correlation to the Bahamas, a very thick sequence that actually raises the Bahamas, making it shallower uh, today in the ocean than the rest of its Caribbean counterparts. So imagine the red wall limestone represents that same environment from the same time frame where the Kaskaskia Sea was depositing extensive carbonates throughout the North American craton. The deep red color from the red wall limestone is not actually the color of the limestone itself. The limestone actually is a grayish color inside, but the staining of the outside of the rock comes from iron oxides that have leached down through layers above it. So it has a very distinctive layer. In matter of fact, because of how thick it is, it is a notable layer for hiking, telling you about the proximity of where you're located from the rim down to the river. So the red wall limestone actually touches part of the river basin, which is important to note as you're hiking through the region. You will find plenty of fossils in the red wall limestone. Having seen it in person, I can tell you that it's full of crinoids, brachiopods, mollusks, gastropods, corals, even fish fossils, and an occasional happy trilobite. So the red wall limestone is definitely a marine limestone, but it is cluttered with lots and lots of fragments of crinoids. What did this do for sediments? As the Kaskaskia Sea regressed off the craton during the late Mississippian, the carbonate deposition would change and it would be filled with detrital sediments like sandstones. Illinois Basin is an example of this because it contains excellent sandstones that are known to bear great petroleum reserves. So this would be the area like that that you would see and understand that the uh, highlands from the Acadia area are going to produce a lot of the sands that you would see coming into the shallow sea as the Kaskaskia regressed. When we talk about marine life in the Mississippian, we need to look at a variety of life forms. Remember the Devonian concluded with the mass extinction event. So we're gonna have a time of recovery and that's exactly what we see. Ammonoids and brachiopods are gonna be quick to fill those niches that are empty and stromatoporids and tabulate rugose corals have declined as reef builders. 
However, crinoidal, any kind of echinoderm is rocking and rolling during the Mississippian. Also, bryozoans, especially lacy fenestrate uh, versions, which you'll learn about here shortly, uh, calcareous algae and brachiopods would build large structures into reef-like materials. Now, when I say large, nothing in comparison to Devonian or Silurian, but for the small organic reefs that existed in the Mississippian, they were of nice size. This is a lacy fenestrate bryozoan. Uh, this is very common during the late Paleozoic, especially during the Mississippian. And these are crinoid fragments found in rock material. So we find these types of fossils very prevalent in most Mississippian-aged carbonate rocks. So that would be from early to middle Mississippian before it transitions to more sandy-like sediments at the end of the Mississippian. Crinoids had very limey plates that make up their stems, and geologists, is what they look for in the rock record, they mainly find these. They usually don't find the flowers to go with them. So these are very distinguishable. They may look like a couple of other fossils that are uh, cephalopods that are non-coiling cephalopods. The difference is they have distinctive columns that make up their stems where in a cephalopod, they're gonna have chambers. So you can distinctively tell the difference between the two by looking at the columns. And you can see the little individual columns right here. These are the limey plates that make them up. So how do crinoids live? This is kind of a fascinating story. So I'm gonna take a minute to tell you my experience with their close uh, living descendants today, which would be sea lilies. So there's a number of different types of species of echinoderms that kind of fold up like basket stars and brittle stars, and they'll come out to feed usually at night. And one of the things I can tell you is if you dive ever for scuba diving, you need to see the same reef during the day, and you need to see the same reef at night in the same 24-hour period. And why is that? Because the reef becomes alive at night and you can see some things you don't normally see. It sounds a little eerie, but you can really see pretty well underwater with flashlights. And if it's full moon, you don't even need those. It's really, especially um, in somewhere like the Bahamas where it's very shallow, you don't need much light to see. The moonlight does the work for you. But in the term of this guy, this is a story and it's a true story. We mapped out coral reef fringing reefs underwater and during the day. So we'd, leave, we'd map out a grid, we would photograph underwater where organisms were. So let's say this guy was all wrapped up and looks like a big old tumbleweed, for real. That's kind of what they look like when they're all folded up. And we'd map where he was and then at night we'd go back and we'd go see where everything was. If it had moved, if it hadn't moved, and we'd, we'd map. What was crazy was these guys got up and walked. <laughs> they moved, and here's why. They have these little feet, and these feet allow them to suck on to rocks, and then they can move to a more desirable filter feeding location. Not all echinoderms can do this, but the crinoid versions can, and it makes them very uh, good filter feeders for their time. Another important marine life form to discuss is the blastoid. This is the brother to the crinoid. They were very common in the Mississippian period. Not as many people know about blastoids, but they're really cool fossils. They kind of look like a hickory nut, and some people nickname that for what they are, but they were also suspension feeders just like crinoids. So they'd have a little stem that came off in a, a different type of filter feeding apparatus that came out the top of their buds, but they were distinctively a different shape from crinoids. So you put them side by side, can you tell which one is the crinoid, which one is the blastoid? So if you listed the lapped as the blastoid, you were correct, so bravo. Notice it has a, a different nut shape as opposed to the actual flower that is made in a crinoid. Very similar, but blastoids did not make it through the Permian mass extinction event. Most crinoids went extinct, but some of the uh, species such as sea lilies and other types of crinoids would survive the mass extinction event. Blastoids weren't so lucky. When we think about Mississippian marine life, bryozoans need to come to mind. These are 
uh, branching and lacy fenestrate bryozoan. See if you can guess what this guy is. You learned about him. He's a brachiopod. So what are bryozoans? We've learned a little bit about them throughout the periods thus far, but they're kind of like plant animals. They're called moss, uh, sea mosses, and they are filter feeders. But what makes them so special is they actually encrust on rock and that makes and anchors in that rock. So it leaves a pretty good rock record behind. They're very complex. I know they look simple, but they have a complete nervous system and a digestive system. So they are not too different from us. Fenestrate bryozoans are the lacy versions, and they have a lace-like fan like you see in this picture. And each individual animal lives in an individual cavity known as a zoarium. So each one of these animals makes a colonial fit. So all bryozoans are colonial. There's a special type of lacy fenestrate bryozoan that looks like a corkscrew called Archimedes, very famous type of fossil. They look like big giant screws. Some of them are really, really tiny, like not even a thickness of a pencil, more like a straw. And others have can be multiple inches wide. I've seen some uh, lacy fenestrate Archimedes that were very impressive in size. I had some uh, students bring me some samples of one that they were just floored by how big these uh, Archimedes were. They had just learned about them in class and went hunting and saw them in the ground and were like, wow, I know what that is. And fun to be able to connect the two things together, what you learn about in your classes at college and apply it in your real life. Foraminiferans are a big story in the Mississippian marine environment. These are single-celled microscopic marine organisms. They make shells, and in those shells, uh, they actually have something important, which we'll get to later on. But nevertheless, these little shells will accumulate in the bottom of the ocean, and they will literally be tens of thousands of these little individual shelly material per cubic centimeter. So this is a scanning electron microscope. This is actually an artist's depiction of what they look like. And I want to point out this purple halo in there. That's the material that they're going to photosynthesize from. That's going to help contribute to the development of fossil fuels. And we'll be looking at that later in the semester. Nevertheless, certain specific types of forams are notorious to live for a very brief period of time, which makes them excellent markers for index fossils. That's why a specific series of species are known to be excellent index fossils for the Mississippian period because they lived for such a short, brief period of time. They were widespread and easily recognizable in rock layers. You're like, well, I wouldn't see them. You have to have the right scopes, but the geologist and paleontologist who would be looking for these can easily distinguish them within just a moment or two of looking at them under a microscope. All right, that moves us into looking on land. Let's talk about some of the animals that uh, moved to land. Because remember back in the Devonian, we got our first amphibian. It was our primitive version. We're going to see a much more advanced version in the Mississippian. A strange group of amphibians evolved by the late Mississippian, and they had a special type of wrinkled and folded chewing surface on their teeth, which is how they got their name, labyrinthodonts the daunts referring to teeth and the wrinkling of the labyrinth. So labyrinthodonts were pretty big. If they got up to about six feet long and lived in swampy conditions and in rivers and streams, they weren't very fast moving on land. They would have been excellent predators in water. So you would have wanted to look out for them if you were crossing a wetlands or a stream because they might eat you for lunch. They ate vegetation, fish, insects, and other amphibians, anything that they could eat that would be in their realm, they would look at. But they weren't just carnivorous. They were also, uh, you would call them omnivores. So an important development is a drum roll moment for evolution of animals on land. Amphibians have a challenge when it comes to reproduction. They must return to the water to lay their gelatous eggs. What does that mean? They dry out if they didn't. So when evolution produced a change in the way animals could lay eggs by developing an amniotic egg, this changed everything. 
It allowed vertebrates to colonize land. It liberated them as much as the plants when gymnosperm seeds evolved. So the amniotic egg appears in the late or upper Mississippian aged rocks and we have our first reptile fossil from that time period. In this egg, the embryo is surrounded by a liquid-filled sac called the amnion, and it has a yolk, which is the food sac. That yolk is used to feed the animal, and then a waste sac. And the waste sac is simply there to help remove any of the waste from the embryo. When reptiles came out of these eggs, they were basically little bitty adults, much like human babies are. They come out, they're little people, they're little reptiles. So there was no need to have an intermediate stage of being a larval stage. Most of you would recognize uh, tadpoles to frogs as being a larval stage. This definitely freed reptiles to colonize all sections of land and it totally changed the diversification and radiation of vertebrates throughout the world. West Lothiana discovery was a big deal in paleontology, and why is this? It's a late Mississippian deposit of a reptile. Now, this reptile does have amphibious features as well. So conclusively, you might say the first undisputed reptile appears in the early Pennsylvanian, but most paleontologists now have moved the first reptile to the late Mississippian. Certainly, the authors of your textbook have done that. So these guys ate mostly grubs and insects, and a couple of things that differed about them. They had different jawbones, skull structure, the location of their ear, limb and vertebral construction that was indicative of spending time on land. So there was a Mississippian climate shift at the end of the Mississippian period. Here's what happened. We had a bunch of soil by now. Think back to the Devonian when soils evolved and now we've had tens of millions of years of development of soils in areas across the world, especially in areas that never had the Epiric Seas of the Kaskaskia invade the continents like we certainly did in North America. Understand that soils absorb carbon dioxide. That's one of their benefits. That's one reason we wanna keep soil in place for climate change this actually lowered the greenhouse effect and it caused a new series of glaciation to occur in Gondwana land. So what would happen is we would see the seas regress and Kaskaskia actually began to regress and fully regress by the end of the Mississippian. So what did this do? As the sea left the craton, obviously any apiric sea habitat would be shattered and lost and so you would see a faunal loss in marine departments, especially for crinoids, blastoids, ammonites, even brachiopods, and certainly foraminifera. So that's one of the reasons forams are a really good index fossil for the Mississippian along with crinoids and even blastoids for that matter because they represent uh, a narrow window of existence of the species that lived at that time and they took a hit at the end of the Mississippian. However, there was no mass extinction event. Let's look at some Mississippian highlights and conclude the key points that you need to know for this period. The beginning of the Mississippian was marked by the same type of black shaley deposits that we saw in the upper or late Devonian, which was the Chattanooga Shale, same kind of stuff. And then we would see the Kaskaskia Sea again move forward where it would start to transgress again and we would lay down substantial thicknesses of carbonate rock that was very littered with crinoid fragments, which is subsequently where the age of the crinoids comes from. Remember that the red, uh, that the red, remember that the red wall limestone is a Grand Canyon gem that represents the same carbonate deposition that the Bahama Banks had. It's a very thick layer that's a noticeable layer throughout the entire Grand Canyon as a marker. We saw our first advanced amphibian, the labyrinthodont, and we also saw the evolution of the amniotic egg and the first reptile by the very end of the Mississippian. There was no mass extinction, but there was minor extinctions in the response to glaciation in Gondwana land. 
As we prepare to move into the Pennsylvania, and I'd ask that you go back and review this section over cyclothems, reread that, and look at the diagrams in your book so that you are freshly familiar with one of the biggest concepts of the Carboniferous, specifically Pennsylvania. I'll see you back at the next lecture. Bye.